Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us on another installment of IDFA's virtual programming. I'm Tom Wojno, Senior Vice President of Membership, and thank you for attending this webinar on automating your milk supply. The COVID-19 outbreak has highlighted a critical use for automation throughout supply chains. The advantage of remote, real-time access to your entire milk supply chain has never been more fully appreciated by dairy companies, haulers, and producers alike. Milk supply chain, as we all know, is complex, and so leveraging a combination of best practice and technology is helpful and useful in realizing efficiencies and savings to your P&L. Today, we're joined by Gold Business Partner, Contact Group International, experts in milk supply chain management solutions across six continents. We're here to gain insight on how to avoid costly mistakes when tackling an automation project. And Contact Group Technical Director, Jamie Ridley, will be joined by former Nestle Global Milk Solution Project Manager, Tomas Vera, to present five things you need to know when automating your milk supply. Before we begin, I have just a few housekeeping items to cover. All lines will be placed on mute. This webinar is being recorded and slides will be available as well as the recording in our Knowledge Center under the webinars tab. For any technical difficulties, please email membership at idfa.org and please submit your questions. As you know, we're all expert Zoom users at this point. Please submit any and all questions using that Q&A tab on the bottom of your dashboard. So now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Jeremy Ridley is Technical Director at Contact Group International. Jeremy joined Contact Group directly from university and has spent the last 25 years developing milk supply chain solutions for the global dairy industry. Tomas Vera is Senior Project and Product Manager of Dig Digital Transformation at PwC. Uh, he was consulting uh, manager for digital transformation uh, now at uh, PwC Switzerland, but previously was in global IS and IT, as well as project management with Nestle, working on solutions to managing milk sourcing for Nestle across 25 countries. Not at all a tall order, right, Thomas? Uh, with that, I want to thank you both for being here. I want to thank Contact Group for your partnership. And with that, Jeremy, I'm pleased to pass it along to you. Thank you. Can you do it for me? Jeremy, you should have control of the slides now. Just let us know if you don't. Okay, we're just uh, we're just sorting that one out now. No, perfect, perfect. Thank you, thank you again for being here, and uh, look forward to the presentation. For the introduction, Tom. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining us here today. Um, we've been in this industry for over 20 years, and I've witnessed a range of uh, innovative changes from the farm right through to the fork. And uh, actually, the dairy industry has always been a leader in innovation. I mean, you have to be innovative. Um, you have you have a perishable product in this industry. It has to be produced, collected, tested through rain, hail, COVID. And then when you throw into the mix the vagarities of machinery, humans, animals, compliance, and legal requirements. And on top of that, you have to think about being sustainable as well. Um, I believe Nestle as a country, um, as a company, needs no introduction. And I too would like to say a big thank you for, to Thomas for joining me here today. But before we dig into this detail, I thought it would be beneficial to add context as to why I'm here today and where it began for us here at Contech in the New Zealand dairy industry. When we started here back in 1974, a long time before I started at this company, uh, we were asked by the dairy industry, excuse me for a second, Sorry, we just lost our, lost our PowerPoint there for a second. Uh, we were asked by the New Zealand dairy industry to uh, connect milk analyzers to uh, PCs so that they could automatically collect um, test results within laboratories. At the time, technology uh, in the 1970s was quite old 
and the consensus were, was that it couldn't really be done. Um, but uh, everybody turned out to be wrong and we worked out, we worked with the uh, FOSS company in Denmark to write the protocol to enable uh, our two products to connect together. So we connected uh, our software with the FOSS analyzers. And from that point on, uh, we continued uh, digitizing various parts of the milk supply chain around the world. Initially concentrating on New Zealand and Australia. However, from our research, as we were going through our development processes, we came to understand uh, differences in the global requirements from country to country within the supply chain. And so when Nestle approached us to deploy a global solution for 25 countries, it really validated our thinking and how we developed. We now will have access to the tools to really accelerate this automation and digitization. Sure, some countries or companies have put their resources into certain areas and some areas have uh, been left behind. Quite often we've found that to be in the automation of the uh, milk supply chain and that's understandable. It's a very complex area and you can't afford to get it wrong. Uh, the deployment of Nestle uh, for us offered a similar opportunity to what we had all those years ago when working uh, with FOSS in the 1970s. It allowed us to innovate with Nestle and work on a deployment model that had never been achieved in the dairy industry before. With this highly successful global rollout, uh, Thomas and I certainly learned a lot about the global dairy industry. So Thomas, uh, before you impart your five must do's in automating the dairy supply chain, I'm keen to understand some of the key drivers behind uh, Nestle's decision to move to an automated process and their supply chain operations given it must have been a massive undertaking. Uh, yes, indeed. Well, you know, first and foremost, we, we have to understand the, the context. Nestle had spent uh, more than 10 years harmonizing and standardizing uh, most of their processes across the whole group globally. And, but this was not the case for, for dairy procurement. <clears throat> Actually, it was, as you said, considered too complex and, and too localized uh, to each country and their specificities. Uh, at the same time, there was a, a need uh, to provide harmonized and detailed reports on, on milk sourcing across the globe. But because of this fragmented landscape of solutions, it took months um, for, for a team at, you know, HQ, in HQ to compile all the data um, so that it could be comparable across countries. And, and, and thus it was not really useful in any tactical decision-making. It was kind of part of the yearly reporting. However, <clears throat> despite these, these strong drivers, the actual, the final push to, to launch the project came from, from two or through two separate channels and almost at the same time. Um, some of the local systems that were being used in, in some of the Nestle countries were, were obsolete. And, um, and their continued maintenance was now really at risk. It, it, it really, uh, you know, hanged upon few people, um, you know, down to even like one person in one of the countries that had the knowledge of, of, those, uh, of those old systems and, um, and could be, uh, and was the only person that could uh, update uh, when necessary to, you know, to, to follow new, um, new government uh, regulations and so on. And at the same time, consumers in, in these countries and in others were asking for um, more and more visibility on the traceability uh, of, the, of the dairy products they consume and where that milk was coming from. So all of these events together really led to, to Nestle kicking off this, this massive project to, um, to automate and modernize and, and standardize their um, milk uh, or their dairy procurement system. That's very similar to uh, the feedback we hear from other dairy organisations around the world, both from the smallest to the largest of dairy companies. Uh, particularly in the milk supply chain, many uh, companies are running very old technology as that's all their systems will run on. For those of you who have been considering or heading down this path, you'll know digitisation allows optimization, which improves efficiencies and helps drive sustainability within industries generally. We usually find that uh, the complexity of the milk supply chain is largely underestimated and most companies end up with disparate systems often running 
many processes on spreadsheets that uh, require significant manual resource, both to maintain and audit. Uh, over time, as requirements change and the interaction between disparate systems and spreadsheets becomes more and more overbearing and complex. The true costs of running these systems can be uh, astronomical, and, uh, but when optimized and integrated within one platform, there are so many benefits and savings. To illustrate a simple example, it's, common, it's a common situation that we're presented with where there may be a core payment and procurement system, and then separate systems for a producer payroll or a transportation system with significant uh, integrations between the three environments, which can, delete, uh, can lead to delays or inaccuracies and uh, significant cost to maintain over time. Um, the benefit of an integrated all-encompassing system is a reduction in vendors, in this case from uh, three to one in this example, a reduction in cost, increases in accuracy and timeliness of information, and a reduction in overall risk. So Thomas, uh, what were some of the key advantages the, businesses, uh, the business saw as a result of automating the Nestle supply chain? Well, um, you've covered uh, many of them on, on, on your example and what you mentioned um, just now. Um, but, um, you know, I mentioned some of the reasons for kicking off the project. But once we started, once we really got started with it, we realized there were so many more uh, advantages and, and, and um, that we could gain. First and foremost, I would say, the milk sourcing processes are complex and, and vary due to local regulations. And, um, and this was the reason why, you know, it was not so obvious from the beginning to, to replace all of these systems with, with just the one. Um, you know, so we needed the, the capability of uh, adapting to those scenarios, uh, both in, in developing countries as well as developed countries. And, and this, this meant that, you know, Nestle could really use only one system globally if we could adapt to that. And, and we would manage then to reduce, in the case of Nestle, from uh, 27 vendors at the time to one. Um, and centralizing the support and, and maintenance um, massively reduced IT costs. Um, <clears throat> one, one central system also um, gives HQ the capability of, of drilling down to the lowest level of detail real time. Um, you know, they could, they could look at traceability of, you know, a single truck uh, of milk arriving at a factory, you know, anywhere in the Nestle world, you know, just with one click, which was impossible before. They had to take months to compile this annual report. And that was all the visibility that HQ could get. So this, this timeliness and accuracy of information provided them, uh, you know, a view into the operations that was really unthinkable before. You know, it supported compliance of their corporate objectives on traceability, auditability, and overall sustainability initiatives. And it really provided Nestle with a, with a definite uh, competitive advantage. Um, besides the direct business advantages that I just mentioned, on the IT side, there was really, um, you know, having one cloud-based system meant that, you know, standardized and controlled change management globally. Streamlined maintenance, and at the same time, we could offer to the various countries running or using the system 24 hours um, support because it was always, uh, as Nestle calls it, a follow the sun approach. It was always somewhere where people were awake and in, and in office hours to give support and, and maintenance. So that, that would be, uh, that would be the, the, the Nestle experience and, and the main highlights of, of those advantages that we, that we uh, obtained. Thanks, Thomas. Um, digital transformation of the supply chain has become more topical in recent years as a, more, as a result of more regulation and compliance. Uh, the need to be more sustainable and sufficient, um, efficient, and as Thomas mentioned, you also need to cater for consumer demands around traceability and animal welfare. Given the current pandemic, it has become even more apparent that automated accurate processes and data are so important. Um, what other key drivers would you include, Thomas? Well, um, I mentioned it before, and I think I would like to highlight it again. Government regulations around food safety 
um, are, are definitely an important driver. Um, regulations change, they become stricter, um, and you want a system that allows you to, to, to adapt and to, and, you know, to, and to follow and to comply with those regulations quickly and, and, and efficiently and cheaply. Um, another one would be in, in developed countries and also more and more in developing ones as well, milk producers are demanding real-time tools to, to be notified on collections, uh, collection issues, but also on, their, um, on the quality and the volumes of the milk that they, that they deliver over time uh, to be able to improve their, their, their processes, uh, their ways of working, the feed. Um, and and another, another demand that we saw from, from, our, from the producers was actually um, more on the, what I would call the, um, the, the feedback, the social feedback loop, which was really on rating uh, collection drivers, for instance, you know, how, how the relationship with the, with the, with the collection drivers was, um, because that's in a way their first touch point with the, um, with, with the, with the buying company. Another, another important, um, important driver is the, that more um, processors are moving to, to daily testing and there are more complex uh, quality requirements and, and tests associated with this, with this approach. And, and this creates the need for you know, more complex producer payroll formulae uh, you know, to incentivize uh, continued improvements in the milk quality based on you know, bacteriology and so on. Um, another driver I also talked about before was, 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 um, was aging. Um, you know, in our experience, uh, the systems were at least 20 years old. Um, many of them were also you know, from the 80s, so you know, 40 plus years old. And, and they were uh, increasingly unsupported and unable to cope with the with the changes in the industry. You know, of course, there there were cases where um, there were modern systems uh, that were either developed uh, within the cooperatives or, or the dairy companies. Um, but these are, are generally done for for their use in the specific location where they are. And um, and and on the one side, they are extremely expensive to develop. Because they are, you know, they, they are, um, they are a big percentage of, uh, you know, of the effort for one company to bear, and and they're often not highly configurable, so this makes it difficult to adapt and easily cope with with that changing, you know, business requirements, uh, regulate regulatory requirements, um, uh, you know, and and it re it really brings the reliance uh, on the individual staff. Of the of the dairy companies to you know that develop these systems to to keep maintaining it, you know to be concrete in in, in Nestle we looked at the systems available um, in these countries and um, you know Nestle India had developed a system 20 years ago that was shared with uh, Nestle Pakistan and Nestle Sri Lanka and and despite you know besides being updated it was very or too specific to the ways of working of of those countries. Latin American countries, for example, had mainly uh, AES 400 based systems uh, from, you know, from the 80s. And, um, and that, that the, the rigidity and the, and the age of this platform led them to develop uh, locally add-ons to, to, you know, to, to satisfy some of these needs of interacting with the farmers or, or you know, in some cases for the, for the um, invoicing. And, um, you know, and, and they developed that as an add-on locally and they ended up being really so specific that again, it couldn't be shared with a with a neighboring country um, uh, with, within the group. So um, another another uh, important driver is 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 of course um, is of course cost uh, costs. We we are you know we were experiencing in Nestle really high costs associated with um, with the existing uh, existing automated and, and 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 in many cases manual processes. And the reconciliation effort of all the data across, you know, these disparate systems. You know, this obviously is very specific to each country. They were not all in the same um, in the same shape. But we we saw that even in developed countries, there were many manual steps. You know, some we even saw using fax machines uh, to send over tally sheets and things like that. And and this made the processes inefficient, very slow very expensive and, and particularly very error prone because there were a lot of manual steps and manual copying of data and entering into another system. Finally, the last one I would like to highlight is, is, the, um, 
and this was particularly the case for Nestle, but I'm sure it's happening, you know, across the globe to all the dairy industry, is the, the focus on, you know, on the on the sustainability and particularly the carbon emissions targets, um, given the impact that uh, the dairy industry has on the environment. And, and, you know, putting the required tools in place that would help Nestle to, to measure and therefore to then achieve the sustainability policies and, and lower the carbon emissions would have been impossible without a modern system, you know, integrated, highly configurable, centralized, and, uh, and you know, and, and because of this, because we had it, or we put it in place, it was in the end relatively easy to extend it and deliver their, um, their um, the, let's say the measures or the, or the, yeah, the support, the tool necessary to measure those uh, sustainability targets really quickly. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, as mentioned previously, uh, many businesses still run their operations on spreadsheets or have many disparate systems with no uh, central master data and lots and and lots of integrated processes where there's no control over accuracy of uh, results. Uh, what advice would you give to a dairy processor who may be considering a move away from the way it's always been done to a more automated process? Well, we need to understand that a lot of these manual processes are actually uh, controls uh, that were put in place to try to reduce fraud uh, and to keep track of collections. They exist as an evolution of, of that procurement process over time. And, and in many cases, they also respond to changes uh, in, and requirements in legislation. However, they are often due to the limitation of the existing system. So they had to be built on top of those very old and in many cases, uh, obsolete and, and you know, difficult to, to maintain and update systems. By bringing in a modern solution that includes things such in, as you know, mobile apps, GPS tracing, many of these controls can be automated or at least significantly optimized. As we were deploying the solution um, within Nessa, we realized you know, jointly with the local teams um, that you know, we, could, we could add more uh, um, controls than what they had in place before, but automatically. Uh, this would have been impossible uh, or, 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 you know, or very, very complex if we had used the old paper-based approach. One, one simple example to illustrate, um, you know, with, with, by having a mobile app and having GPS tagging at the collection, we could make sure that the milk was actually collected from the right farm. Uh, this was not just, you know, um, in the case of, uh, Fraud. I mean, of course, it happened, and it was necessary uh, to to make sure that, that 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 we were, you know, that the milk was being collected at the right farm and not, you know, somewhere else. But but even if it was not intentionally um, wrong, it, it also, you know, if there was a mistake on where the milk was collected, it also broke that that traceability and that auditability chain. So even without uh, um, fraud, the GPS tagging helped to to ensure that. You know the the collection place of the milk was really the one it should have been, and 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 that the um, that the traceability of that milk was was actually uh, true. So uh, we agree that automating the milk supply chain has many advantages. Uh, let's assume that a dairy company has decided to kick off an automation project. What's the first thing that they should do? Well, the the first thing I would recommend is to. Um, is to complete uh, an audit, um, an audit of the existing processes, the existing systems, the existing technologies, to really get a good handle on what's currently being done, by whom, how, uh, whether it's manual, automatically, or you know, or in some other way. That's great advice. Uh, what what roadblocks then did you experience in the early stages of collecting all of this information for Nestle? Well, Nestle is a rather large company and, and, you know, operating in 85 countries. And, and we had 27 countries with milk product manufacturing facilities, all with different solutions in place and all with different local and, and governmental rules and regulations. I thought like, you know, wow, how, how is this possibly going to work? Uh, but in the end, it did. And, and it did because, you know, by strictly adhering to this auditing guideline that we set out at the beginning and that we supply to each of the countries by ensuring that we kept as much consistency, uh, consistency as we possibly could across all the countries in scope 
um, it was possible to to, to you know to uh, to overcome the, this obstacle. Consistency, I would say, then is really the, um, the you know when you're doing the audit, and it's something that you need to keep in, in mind to try to um, to bring everybody to where possible to the same page. True, and uh, I concur that ensuring uh, consistency in the collection of information in an audit uh, helps to speed up the readiness for automation. Uh, what else would you advise in ensuring the success of one of these projects? Well, the, the second must do is definitely, um, is definitely bringing your internal uh, stakeholders on, on the journey and, 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 and to communicate widely Within the company, with with the partners, with the um, with the, um, yeah, with 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 your with your partners, um, you need to rally a committed team with executive sponsorship. Uh, you know, one team that is accountable for the success of the project, that will adhere to the timelines, to the specifications that are set at the beginning. You know, you need a committed team who can really stick to the project plan, to the scope of work, and and you need continuity of the people in this team. Uh, otherwise, the implementation time and the cost will will increase, and the project can can really lose momentum. As we said before, you know, milk uh, the the milk procurement, the milk, the whole milk end to end chain is complex. And um, and if you've gathered your team and you've trained them and they understand, uh, you need to ensure that they that they stick around and that you have this continuity. Um, at Nestle, we had the the chance to, to you know to have a very committed core group. And even though it was difficult at times, you know, due to language differences, geographical differences, uh, you know, the, the project was led out of Switzerland, out of HQ, and um, and the initial deployments were done in South America. We had teams in the in the in you know regional teams across the globe, and you know, in some ways it was it's kind of unique to to the way Nestle is organized, but but really was through the commitment and dedication of that core group that maintained uh, their the you know their, their continuity throughout the project lifecycle that. That uh, that allowed us to to um, to achieve uh, success. Okay, so uh, with a completed audit, uh, stakeholders and a working group at the ready, what what do you do next? Well, the, the third piece of advice uh, in an automation journey is really to to create redundancy in in your processes, and and do away with with disparate data sources through decentralized repository, you know, to be really able to provide this single source of truth of data. Um, so what have been the ongoing benefits of this for the Nestle business? Well, having a, a central system ensure consistency across the countries and, and, and also full support of the, of the group to, to that system. Um, HQ would have then really quick access to information on on the farms, on the transports, on the collections, um, on the production, uh, the quality results from the internal laboratories, from the external laboratories in countries where that's the approach. Um, the you know HQ, a team could compare data across countries very easily. They could make decisions real time with actual business intelligence. The, the at the same time, the relevant information. Um, could be shared back to those producers themselves so that they could use it to improve uh, their production. The IT teams had, had only one system to monitor, which meant uh, making change management, well, riskier potentially, but a lot simpler and very streamlined. Uh, the countries, the various countries benefited from a, a stable system, 24 hour support and, and, and the advantage of, you know, remote deployment of changes or fixes or, or, or new features, which, uh, you know, besides the cost savings, it has been really important during uh, these COVID times, for example. Uh, another very important benefit of, of, of this um, centralization is the, um, you know, is the ongoing collaboration with, with one vendor and the evolution of the solution um, from the vendor, which means that you get new features, you get new functionalities, which would have been really very costly to implement across that fragmented landscape that, that we had before. Uh, so these things are not always easy, easy to achieve, I'm sure. Um, you talked about having a central system to ensure consistency, but how does this uh, affect data? Well, master, master data management is, is, really, is really key. Uh, you, need, you need 
it to be right because you need this single source of truth. We, we recognized this during the, um, the first implementations uh, on, the first, on, on our first country, which was Argentina. Much of the data was coming from, from multiple systems, as you, as you illustrated before. It was difficult to reconcile. So during the implementation of that first market, we created tools that allowed us to, to validate and format the data from all those various systems to ensure that consistency, to make sure that we could really map it and, and find, find issues with it. And, um, and then we use that, those same tools uh, to, you know, we, we, we put the emphasis on the, on, the, on the next markets, on the next countries that we're implementing to, to use those same tools and to follow the same validation rules that we had developed in the first countries to, to really ensure that, you know, that the, that the project was successful like, like we did in the pilot. And, and really, uh, it, it, takes, it takes time to, um, to gather the data, to extract it from the old systems, to, and to make sure that it's consistent, that it's you know, complete and in the right format. Because as we said, some of these systems are old and, and, and it's only when you're doing this audit and when, when, you're, you know, when you're extracting the data that you find that even in the old system, there were, there were issues, there were things that were, um, that were um, yeah, well, not right, that, but they were not affecting the process at the time. And, and another important factor I would like to mention now is, is actually you need to you need to you need to know your 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 end user base. You know, Nestle operates in a variety of different countries with with really different levels of technology adoption. We we had some users that had never seen a, a mobile phone before, and and we were asking them to convert you know their data from paper based tally sheets uh, to to um, you know to a technology that they had never used. And uh, and did not know how to you know how to handle the, the mobile phones and and sometimes these these changes are really big not just for say the the collection the the, the, the truck drivers or the farmers themselves but even sometimes to the to the teams to the um, to the um, the the, administ the yeah the administrative teams working in those factories in those countries they are not used to some of these new technologies even themselves. Okay, so far um, we've completed an audit, uh, engaged internal stakeholders, and we have a team that's accountable uh, in centralizing data. But what's, uh, what's the next step? Well, the, the next step would be to identify all the, um, all the manual processes uh, that, that, are, that, are, are, that, that exist and identify you know, which ones can be uh, digitized or, or even fully automated. Now, of course, uh, th th there is always a cost to, to, to digitizing and, out and automating. So you, you need to focus on the most uh, labor intensive ones first. But um, with a modern and configurable system, unless there are very, very localized uh, processes due to either the local regulations or to specific local company requirements, you should be able to digitize and automate quite a lot. Uh, however, the, the local framework uh, the local legal framework needs to be carefully analyzed. Um, for example, in, in, in some of the countries uh, where we implemented uh, the, this, the system, we still had to allow um, uh, the team to print a paper version of the uh, collection route, uh, even though you know, it existed in the mobile app with, with, with waypoints and, and GPS coordinates, because local regulations required the truck drivers to, to drive around with a physical piece of paper that that indicated the collection that we're supposed to do um, on the other end of the spectrum um, in pakistan for example we, we could get rid of a lot of the paper that was being used because the local regulations allowed a, um, a an sms sent to the farmer as a receipt of the milk that they had delivered so we could get rid of of tally sheets and, and paper uh, talents that were given to those farmers and and were usually lost and so on um, by uh, um, by an SMS message, which was infinitely cheaper and, and and faster, and and more importantly, that SMS could be sent from the centralized system of Nestle to the farmer directly, and and was not written by a local um, intermediary in a in a collection center, for example. There was a lot of fraud going on there. You know, the the farmer would deliver his I don't know ten liters of milk. These are very small farmers. They would deliver their 10 liters of milk. And then the local intermediary would say, well, you know, the price uh, today is, uh, you know, this. 
here's your here's your money. Uh, with the SMS, Nestle would send out a message saying, you know, we receive your 10 liters. Uh, the price is this, so you should have gotten, you know, what what whatever many rupees uh, you are entitled to. And and this really reduced a lot of the fraud happening between those intermediaries who would be getting the the actual money that they needed to pay the farmers from Nestle with their commission and would still be re um, retaining more than they were due because they could tell the farmers in a way whatever they wanted. So, um, you know, we not only saved on paper, we, we really reduced immensely the fraud and the farmers were incredibly happy to be getting these SMSs immediately um, with with actually what they were entitled to, you know, with what they were owed by, by those intermediaries. So that, that really was really nice to see. So being flexible to the requirements of your local market is important. Um, although digitizing processes wherever possible is a must as well. Uh, what would be your final piece of uh, advice in automating a milk supply chain? Well, I would say is that you need to select a proven solution. You need to do your research. You need to look for references from businesses that, that have already done this successfully. And, and you, need, you need to trust the experts uh, like we did in Nestle. Technology uh, is advancing at such a rapid rate. Um, what's what's the most important thing uh, when you're selecting a vendor or a solution? Well, it, it must be fully integrated and, and it must be highly configurable. We, we talked about before these, these regulation changes, expectation from consumers change, expectation from farmers change, expectation from uh, intermediaries change. Uh, so you need to be, it needs to be really, you know, highly configurable. And so that you can make these changes quickly, cheaply, and, and when required. So the, the, the vendor that you're looking for needs to have a, a flexible solution. Um, it needs to, um, for, for, for example, for Nestle, you know, the, it, we, had, we had changes in local regulations happening across these 25 countries pretty much all the time because, you know, regulations were changing somewhere uh, um, in, in one country or another every day, pretty much. And, and we needed to be able to, to react quickly. So that, that was really that was really key. And, and because we were running our this one single centralized instance, we needed it to be really flexible so that it could be adapted quickly to, to those changes in, in you know from country to country. Another important thing when selecting a, a solution is the vision of the vendor. For instance, uh, does the vendor have a history of innovation, first of all? Do they um, you know do they have an open approach? To a, a compliant API-based integration um, that that you can utilize. Uh, this was also very important. In Nestle. The biggest challenge in many of these digital projects in general is is the is is the integration to the to your existing systems. You know, we talked about aligning the master data. That's another big challenge. But but the technical well the actual you know integration is 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 the second one I would say Nestle for example runs SAP as their ERP, and it was a must for for us to be able to integrate directly uh, any new um, or any any new milk um, sourcing system with SAP, uh, and we wanted it to be out of the box. Uh, for us we we had the view that the first thing we needed to do was really replace the the existing systems. Uh, consistently and, and get immediate results in terms of, of those e efficiency and, and cost saving objectives that we had, as well as the traceability that we were requested or required to provide. And, um, you know, but looking into the future, our leadership were asking also uh, questions about, you know, on farm management, supervision, uh, doing audits at the farms. Uh, the sustainability and the, and the carbon um, emission reduction uh, programs that I mentioned before, and, and we we needed to consider whether the solution, you know, that, that the solution that we were going to select had this ability built in uh, going forward. Um, and finally, I would say the the you know a fully integrated system that you know allows you to have this instant access to accurate data is what empowers the the actual business intelligence. And, um, and and as I said before, for Nestle, this this was a radical change from from this report that took months to collect and to compile, which gave no tactical decision-making capability at all, to having 
everything they wanted down to the specific, I don't know, milk protein result of that specific delivery in that specific country, you know, with one click. And, you know, they, they could generate all kinds of reports, all kinds of graphs, they could forecast, they could budget, and obviously they could um, answer those compliance and traceability and auditability uh, requirements that they had. We, you know, for us, there was really only one choice that would, uh, that would fit the bill. Thanks, Thomas. So uh, working with dairy uh, processes from all over the world, what, what's the most, in, most common pitfall that uh, companies uh, fall into when embarking on a automation project for their supply chain? Well, we mentioned it a couple of times. Um, I think that they underestimate the complexity involved in dairy sourcing. Uh, at, at Nestle, we went through a, a, um, a global implementation of SAP to manage the entire business. And, and milk pro procurement, even though it was considered, um, it was eventually left out because of that complexity. Um, when, we, when we started the search for, for a new solution uh, with, with, to, you know, to, to so sort the problem, uh, many in Nestle considered it really too hard, uh, too complex, uh, because of those combined specificities across those 25 to 27 countries. Um, you know, I, I think many would make the mistake of, of thinking that it is like the procurement of, of goods in the global market. You know, just you know, collect the milk and pay the transport and pay the farmer and you're done. But if you really think about it as a as the procurement of other commodities, you you, you definitely will fail. Um, you know, as part of, of our process, we, we actually studied the industry for many months. We, we brought sourcing experts from, from the various countries to work with the project team um, on site. We, we visited countries and we, we, you know, we went to farms, we went to the transport companies, we went to the collection centers, to the cooperatives. We really became a part of that supply chain uh, and, and, and we, you know, to, to try to under, understand it as intimately as we could within the time we had prior to even you know moving to starting the vendor selection process we really we really needed to understand how the collection works what you know what is tested at the farm what is uh, tested at the collection centers what tools do the truck drivers use what tools do the collection centers use what piece of paper we we always got you know we always asked them for examples and taking pictures of their tally sheets and and taking them home and i remember the ones in in chinese that we had to get translated uh, you know well, what does a factory reception do what, what what are the what are the tools that they do what are the paper sheets that they do what are the excel tables that they have um you know what do the external laboratories do what what kind of outputs do they give you do they send it to you by email what is the you know what what are they giving you what is the templates what are the formats all of that we needed to understand what the farmers are expecting to get back and so on and so forth we really needed to embed ourselves in this process and 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 only then we evaluated the possible solutions available around the world and you know to select really the one that could do the job thanks thomas and, and finally if there was one thing you'd do differently if you were able to go back to the beginning of this journey uh what would that be well overall i am extremely happy on how the project went and and the results we we obtained we uh, we achieve huge savings in, in both, you know, financial and, and, but in efficiency terms, you know, millions per year. The, you know, the, 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 there are thousands of vehicles using the transport scheduling and the route optimization modules. There are hundreds of thousands of farmers currently in the centralized repository. Um, the solution, you know, went live successfully. It never failed. Um, you know, the project even received one of the highest awards within Nestle, which was the CIO award for, for the um, faultless implementation and, and has continued to really be a success even after my departure from the company. But if there is one thing that I would change, and I think it comes back to that point I mentioned before about having that, that consistent core team would be, um, you know, we started with this core team in Switzerland and we had these three regional teams, but it meant that, you know, we, there was a lot of inefficiency because these three regional teams had to learn from the core team everything again. And, um, you know, it was, it, it was inefficient. They, 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 they encountered the same errors and even though there was a central team to help them out, kind of they all had to, you know, go through that learning curve on their own three times. Um, I, if possible, if I went where to go back, I would really challenge that decision and say, no, I think it's best to keep that unique central team and have them go, you know, country by country by country, um, even though it might have taken potentially uh, 
a bit longer. I, I, honestly, with the learnings and the inefficiency we got, I don't even know if it would have taken longer, but I would keep that unique central team um, to do all the implementation. That would be the change. Thanks, Thomas. And uh, that's, uh, that's the end of our um, uh, content. So thank, thank you all for listening and I will uh, hand it back over to the IDFA. Jeremy, Thomas, thank you. Uh, really appreciate not only the insights, but the, the practical application, right? It's, it's one thing to lay a project out, start to finish, but to, to really hear, Thomas, your insights in, in being in the trenches from start to finish, uh, from implementation to execution, you know, is, is really helpful for the audience. Uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, if it's okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll throw them out and, and feel free to, to tackle them, Jeremy and Thomas. Um, the first question from the audience is um, kind of around centralizing systems onto the one platform. What were the, the cultural impact that you had there? Um, what, you know, and how did you get around those, those roadblocks? Um, it's one thing to do it, but it's, it's, it's another thing to, to bring that culture uh, internally uh, along in the process. So uh, what were any roadblocks and how did you get around them? It's a, it's a really good question, and 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 actually, um, you know, I remember a lot of there's a lot of anecdotes on on the, on the cultural aspects. But what what I think was really key is that because the central team uh, really embedded itself on how um, on how the process works, there there were a lot of similarities across the countries. I mean, in the end, uh, you know, collecting milk has a obviously it's this it, you know it's the same milk, and it needs to be processed very quickly, and it needs to be handled. Very quickly, and and when the when the different um, local teams saw that we understood the business, uh, the the communication was really much easier, and then it gave us the opportunity to, to really just tackle the differences. You know, on the payment, for, of course, the formulas are different, the regulations are different, but because they understood that we understood that we were not just you know a team with just coming to try to force them into a solution. We really understood how they worked and the challenges that they had. They were really a lot more accepting. But having said that, I would say that was what for the local teams. I think a lot of the cultural and, and, and challenges that we had were mostly at the level of the management. A lot of the, there were a lot of political tensions because uh, there were budgets, you know, to maintain these systems and, and um, but, but, you know, but luckily, and that's why I come back to this point about, you know, having really uh, your executive stakeholders behind you, because you need them to sort this, this, uh, this, um, this points out. I mean, it was not the, something the project team could do. So... Yeah. Really good question, and uh, I think it comes down to if you if you really if, if if they trust that or they trust you because they they see that you understand what they're doing, it really opens every door. Fantastic, thank you, Thomas. Jeremy, this one might be for you from the audience. You know, given where we are uh, with the current situation around the global pandemic, associated travel restrictions, and uh, kind of red tape both around regulatory and and otherwise cautionary. Uh, what is this, what kind of effect would all of these factors have on uh, implementation uh, of, of your processes? Uh, we've, uh, we've done a majority of all of our implementations remotely. So even, even uh, implementations as close to Australia, as Australia and even in, within our own country, we, we mostly implement remotely. Um, in the in the in the case of Nestle, uh, Nestle uh, organised it so that there was a uh, a multiple a multi-country workshop in 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 each region, and and we attended those workshops so we understood what the requirements were. However, Nestle uh, elected to do their own implementation, so uh, they assembled an, an implement, implementation team. And we uh, attended the implementations of the first two countries being uh, Argentina. So we, we were on site for that one. And so we, we visited that country and we, and we did work there. And uh, we also visited uh, Mexico uh, for part of that implementation. And they were the only countries we ever kind of visited for implementation purposes. So the, the remaining part of uh, uh, Nestle, all those different countries has been done remotely, effectively, um, with the uh, local um, 
Nestle implementation team. So for us, it doesn't have a, a huge impact because we're used to doing things remotely. Um, and we, you know, we operate from these offices 24 hours a day. So our implementations operate 24 hours a day. And going forward after, you know, that experience with Nestle and, and our experience previous to that, um, it's left us in good stead for, uh, you know, more remote implementations. I mean, you can't do that every time, that's for sure. Um, companies do have their own culture and they do like to have people on site and, and we have to cater for, cater for that. But, uh, you know, a lot of the time we're doing our things remote. Got it. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, this question is more along the lines of data integrity uh, as it's related to uh, the migration. How, how do you approach validation of data when you're getting disparate, disparate systems, disparate data sources all coming to one kind of master data uh, uh, compilation? How do you go in and validate that data, you know, once that migration of the master data is completed? What, how does that order of operations really work? Okay, so for us, we can't, um, obviously we can't validate master data. We can confirm that it's in the correct format and we can do all that sort of stuff. Um, and as Thomas mentioned during uh, his, his, his content, uh, you know, we recognized very early on that um, the information coming from the systems, you know, from Nestle uh, was coming from different, you know, multiple different areas. And there was this huge problem of accuracy because, you know, we, we, you know, the data would be given to us, we would migrate it, users would check it and find, you know, that various different things were missing or wrong or whatever compared to their other systems. And so going forward, uh, Thomas recognized along with myself that, you know, we would have to come up with some sort of way of doing this. Otherwise, you know, we were going to encounter this problem another 27 times, right? So we, you know, we came up with a way of um, specifying a format, which was the Nestle format, a Nestle template that people had to work to. And we created a, um, a separate validation tool that uh, took into account the, the relationships between the data and all those types of things, the mandatory fields, that sort of stuff, that we could run all of their templates through from each of the markets and confirm uh, in the first instance that you know, the format of the data, all the phone numbers, bank accounts, and relationships were all correct prior to uh, migrating that data into the system and then having it validated by the users. And so that kind of shortcut of the whole process of doing a migration and then finding all sorts of relationship errors and just allowing us to get a clean data set in there and, uh, and for them to validate you know, the actual data without finding all the other associated problems. Got it, great, thank you. Uh, I've got one final question. I'll put a, a plug out to the audience. Uh, please submit any final questions, but the last one that I have in the queue here is um, on ERP integration. How is this generally handled as uh, part of the implementation process? Do you want to talk about that one, Thomas, or you want me? Well, um, for, I can I can give part of the answer. <laughs> not maybe not so much on the technical side, but um, I think one of the key things when integrating into the ERP is that you need to you need to think about what are the specific key integration points that you must have given your accounting, financial, or operational processes. So what is the information that you need into your ERP from your milk collection? As, as we said, milk procurement, milk collection is, is very specific is very, and it's very complex. And, um, and, and you need to identify what data is it that, that, that you need into, into your ERP and that can be then comparable to the, to the rest of the information you have there. For, for example, and to be very concrete, in Nestle, we needed the volumes uh, received at the factory for production. So we didn't need the, um, the details of, uh, you know, of the traceability and, and so on of the, which milk was in which compartment of the truck. We just needed to know the volume received and, and the percentage of solids that were necessary for the, for the, for the, yeah, for the production and the manufacturing. Um, but we did need then the split uh, for the financial system, for the accounting, if you want, to pay the farmers because the decision was that the payment to the farmers would be done through the ERP as well. So the, the milk sourcing system would calculate 
um, what each farmer would get with all the complex formulas that I mentioned before, you know, based on quality and from the external laboratory, from the internal laboratory, and based on all the complex regulations in the country, it would prepare the invoice for the farmer and so on. And it would just tell the ERP, okay, so this farmer gets this, this farmer gets that, and so on. So we had the volumes at reception for the production, and we had the amounts to be paid to the farmers, and uh, and we had a yeah we had an integration uh, right there on the master data. So we, uh, sorry on the on the vendor. So we needed to have because we were paying those farmers, they needed to be created in the ERP as a vendor, and and so the vendor were first created in in SAP. Uh, and they, they moved through an interface into the milk pro uh, procurement system. Uh, you could not modify the data that was coming from the ERP, but you can then maintain locally in your uh, milk procurement system, the milk procurement specific data. For instance, I don't know, times of collection, uh, geographic, you know, GPS position, all of these were not really important for the ERP because it was just handling the payment, but it was needed for the collection. So. Master data was uh, vendor data was coming from the S from the SAP to the milk system. More data was maintained there. Reception of the factory was then sent back to SAP, and then finally at the at the end of the payment period, which generally monthly, but sometimes every week or whatever, um, then the the um, the milk procurement system would inform the ERP who had to be paid how much. And that was that was it. And again, this can be very different according to the companies, but I think thinking of what are those integration points is really the first step. To that integration and then i mentioned also you know you you need to be looking for a system that can as much as possible out of the box connect and integrate to your to your erp and and, and any other system that you identify key as necessary awesome we've got one final question here and i think we'll wrap um jeremy i think this is for you uh if and then how do you track sustainability and animal welfare compliance with your system Okay, so this is a uh, relatively um, new area, um, and we've we've done a lot of development in this area in response to um, requests from Nestle, and again, it's different in every country. But uh, what we have done is we've created a um, a way of collecting activities that are occurring on farm, so whatever activities they are and a way of managing um, farm audits and farm visits. And we've allowed uh, our clients to collect as many pieces of information as they want, depending on you know, what the activity is. If it's an animal welfare audit, then there'll be a, you know, let's say there's 20 different pieces of information they need to collect. We can configure the system to have a template where they can collect that information recorded against the farm, the, the time, the date, all those types of things, the GPS locations, um, take photos, all, all of that stuff um, we can collect within the system and that can be um, viewed and maintained to a certain extent maintained depending on the type of uh, activity by farmers through our portals and our mobile apps. And so what um, Nestle is doing at the moment, they have a they have a, a global project underway, as Thomas alluded to, to track this information. And so they're building a, um, a tool based on the data that we're collecting for them that is going to um, measure these outcomes that they, that they need to measure in, you know, in terms of animal welfare and sustainability and you know, on-farm practices and all those types of things. And so I think the information that is being collected from farm in terms of uh, compliance is going to get a lot more rather than a lot less as time goes on. And so, uh, you know, that's something that Nestle has been thinking about for a long time. Um, we first discussed it with them in 2015. And so, you know, they're very well placed to deal with that going forward. Uh, it's also something that's happening across here in New Zealand and Australia as well. And so we're rolling out those solutions to all those companies now. Fantastic. I think that is a good place to wrap. We are just at the top of the hour. Thomas, Jeremy, I want to thank you both. Jeremy, I want to thank you for Context Partnership. Uh, you guys are great partners, not only to IDFA, but, but to the industry. So thank you all. Thank you all for being on uh, today. And to our membership, thank you for joining us for IDFA's virtual programming. Uh, we will speak with you again soon. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, guys. Bye.